The next stop is Avenue J. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, fascinating topic. Uh, one that I had no familiarity with before I started researching for tonight's lecture and um, really being opened up myself to an entirely different approach to the uh, period of the Enlightenment, uh, the intersection of Judaism with contemporary science, uh, something that I had some inklings of. I really am exploring a, a lot to greater detail. Um, and I'm fascinated to see how much Luriana Kabbalah is also involved in the story. Today we're going to speak about uh, an important book that has been overlooked by historians for the last hundred years or so, but um, according to the research of Professor David Ruderman, it's likely one of the most influential books in articulating modern Jewish identity. It's, it's quite fascinating, and I, I'm sure you'll enjoy it as well. At least I will enjoy it. So what we're going to be talking about tonight is Rabbi Pinchas Horwitz and his book Sefer Habrit, or The Book of the Covenant, which is a rather remarkable and unusual book. Uh, here's an interesting uh, modern edition of it published in Israel, and you can see it has a, a map of the globe with the land of Israel right, right in the center of it. The... Um, this is a book that is essentially a primer in 18th century science. It was published in 1797 and had phenomenal appeal, incredibly popular, was read widely by all shadings of Jewish opinion in Eastern and Western Europe, and in fact in Asia Minor and in Israel as well. Sephardim, Nistagdim, Maskilim, Hasidim, everybody loved this particular book and it had a seminal influence on the way Jews uh, oriented themselves towards the rapidly expanding scientific discoveries associated with the Enlightenment period. And I think it really crafted a path forward uh, for Jews to follow over the next couple of centuries as well. So we're going to look at what are the basic ideas of this book and try to get a sense of how it affected its readership and, in fact, how its legacy continues to affect us today. Uh, like most of my lectures, they're highly derivative, very, very little original research. I just read a book or two, and then I essentially this is like a book club where only one person gets to speak. <laughs> and, but, so we're going to rely very, very heavily on the recent publication of Professor David Ruderman of the University of Pennsylvania, shown here who has written a rather amazing little book on this subject entitled A Best-Selling Hebrew Book of the Modern Era, The Book of the Covenant of Pinchas Horwitz and Its Remarkable Legacy. So if you're interested in you know, correcting all of the uh, misconceptions that I purvey in the next 55-odd minutes, you can take this book out of the amazing Turo College Library and uh, get a lot more detail. But with that said, by way of preface, let's look straight at this book and try to understand why it had such a phenomenal appeal. And perhaps we'll understand as well why it has been ignored so much in the, uh, the modern area. So this book appeared 1797. It's not right at the very beginning of printing, but it is still in the era where uh, printing is done privately and Rabbi Hurwitz, like many, especially religious authors today, printed this book on his own and then schlepped it around much of Western Europe, uh, offering it on subscription, an advanced subscription to individuals living as far west as London and as far east as uh, parts of Poland. Um, and we know that he had subscribers who were really throughout Italy and, and all of Europe, really. Um, and it was, as I mentioned earlier, widely adopted as a household reading implement for so many tens of thousands of Jews. It's a massive manuscript, about eight, sorry, a printed book, about 800 pages, half of which are dedicated to this exuberant, enthusiastic description of the state of science in the late 18th century. Speaking about all kinds of technologies, some of which I'll go into in the next couple of slides. The second half of the book is a much more conventional um, 
sort of discussion of Jewish ethics, although it takes it to a different level by speaking about the ideal of Jewish society interacting with non-Jewish society, something which was not a major feature of most of the Musser literature, most of the internal Jewish ethical literature of the 18th century. Um, it received uh, uh, enthusiastic approbations from many rabbis, uh, endorsements across the religious spectrum. In fact, he originally published it anonymously, and so many people were wondering about this particular author that uh, there were uh, people who wrote that it must be none other than uh, the Vilna Gaon, the great Lithuanian leader of, uh, of traditional Talmudic community there. Uh, and others said it was actually Moses Mendelssohn, most prominent maskil, most prominent proponent of the Haskalah or the Jewish Enlightenment, active at this time as well, and a great modernizer in many ways. Although the Vilna Gaon in some recent research by Rabbi Eliyahu Stern, has, or Professor Eliyahu Stern has shown that in fact he, he could be uh, viewed as a modernizer in his own right, but that's not for today's lecture. Uh, of course, it, the author was neither of them. It was Pinchas Horwitz, an otherwise unknown but enthusiastic fan of uh, modern science, much like David Gans, who we studied a few weeks ago, uh, who compiled all this research on his own, largely through reading secondary works like David Gans's work, and he published them in what he called an encyclopedia. It's not precisely an encyclopedia. It's not organized like in an alphabetical fashion, but he just gave people sort of like a Reader's Digest, National Geographic kind of overview of science. And it was written in rabbinic Hebrew, uh, and it was just fascinating for Jews who had no other approach to this science other than an attempt to read it in vernaculars that they most likely were not familiar with. Um, and it also had the, uh, the seal of approval of religious authority, meaning this was a kosher guide to so many of the technologies that were literally rocking the world of the 18th century. So many confusing technologies that had so much, uh, you know, potential religious implications. Everything from the uh, immunization against the smallpox the disease uh, to hot air balloons to the astronomy that we looked at a couple of lectures ago. All of these things were potentially challenging to the re religious Weltanschauung, and this rabbinically approved document was a safe way for Jews to access the scientific world of the 18th century. As a result, much like Reader's Digest or National Geographic, it became a staple in so many Jewish homes across Europe, and it informed the eager minds of many Jews for the next 200 years. Went through approximately 40 editions, uh, including several editions that excerpted certain sections that were considered especially important, uh, and one very important pirated edition that we'll speak about later in the lecture. So it was a hugely popular volume. Uh, its popularity dropped off dramatically after World War II for reasons that we will explore. But nevertheless, for the first 150 years since its publication, it's a good, uh, you could make the argument that this was the most popular Jewish book ever printed since the Torah. It was an incredibly popular, well-published book. Uh, Hurwitz himself was a very aggressive and, uh, er uh, what's the right word? Very aggressive and astute book publisher himself. Uh, he even succeeded in inveigling the censor to publish an approbation of the book, which is highly unusual. Uh, in the 18th century and through much of the 19th century and most of Europe, every book had to be approved by a censor for its content. And uh, these were typically uh, Jews who often were conver converts to Christianity, often they were maskilim, uh, who were able to, you know, uh, be culture brokers from the traditional religious society. They could read the text and they could communicate its contents to the uh, governing authorities. And it's very rare to see anything except uh, a stamp of approval from the censor. But in the very first edition, he was actually able to inveigle a letter of approbation, like a religious haskama from the censor, talking about how wonderful this book is and really everyone should read it. This, along with seven rabbinic approbations, made it an extremely popular reading. And um, it, it was founded 
so many Jewish homes. I'd like to say every Jewish home, but that would probably be an exaggeration. Okay, so that's really what this book is. Um, let, let's look at the kinds of things that, that were probably its most popular elements in the first couple hundred years of its existence. Um, this was the first opportunity for Jews to really understand the scientific world that was uh, evolving around them. And he went into um, a level of detail that was not quite you know, at the level of a practitioner, but nevertheless, he was a great early science writer, um, and this is a, a very specialized kind of field to be able to, as, a, as an author, to be able to bridge the gap between the arcane and difficult, it almost sounds Kabbalistic, sort of scientific information, and then relay it in a way to a popular audience that doesn't have the necessary mathematical and physical background to read it. Uh, he was really quite successful at this. And, and he was obviously personally excited about the technologies that he described, kind of like uh, Ira Flato on uh, Science Friday. If you listen to NPR, I mean... Uh, Ira Flato just makes science sound so fun. Disease sounds really fun when Ira Flato is talking about it. So he would talk about things like, for example, he described the, the first hot air balloon flight, which took place in the late 18th century in France. And he said, this is like so exciting. I have to tell you exactly how these balloons are created. And then he goes through and discusses every little detail of how these balloons were put together and kept afloat and navigated and the adventures that the pilots had. They landed in the wrong field. They got beat up by the, the peasants who thought that they were angelic beings or something fascinating uh, scientific ride through the 18th century that readers found absolutely uh, astounding and enjoyable. We have many examples of you know, people like S.Y. Agnon, uh, Chernikovsky, many other intellectuals of the 19th century who describe how they read Sefer, Sefer Abrit when they were younger and how it completely opened their eyes to the world and um, exposed them to the, to the possibilities of, of the scientific revolution. Yes. So that's really what made the book ma most popular. That's what made it unusual. It stood out from the, the other kinds of books that were circulating at the time as you know the one and only real primer of science. And you can imagine that the Jews of the 18th century, as they are in the 21st century, very excited to give their children kosher reading material that will in, inspire them to uh, aspire for greater educational goals and scientific goals and careers and so on. I imagine this book was kind of like the Encyclopedia Britannica was for my generation. Like my parents were very enthusiastic about having an Encyclopedia Britannica in the house and Tens of thousands of copies were sold to families that never cracked them open, although they were really good when you had like Hot Wheels sets and you wanted to build like ramps and things. You could pile them up. But nevertheless, it's the same kind of idea. The parents want to have it in the house so the kids can read it and hopefully become great. So that's really what the book is, is mainly famous for. But there are many other really important things. First of all, it has remarkably important significance in intellectual history for its theological contribution. And this is something that Professor Ruderman really uh, underlines with a fine pen, and it's, it's I think, a very uh, convincing point. Uh, although Hurwitz was not an avid reader of philosophy, he did tend to read a lot of um, second-generation philosophers, or in other words, philosophy that was mediated through some other author, and then he picked it up, and he often gained what exactly was in the original work and conveyed it in his book. And the intellectual underpinnings of his Sefer Abrit um, relied quite heavily on the philosophical discoveries of Immanuel Kant, shown here. Very important Prussian thinker um, who... Um, you know, the, the uh, image of the yekke in Jewish culture, very punctilious, very punctual, very demanding, very precise and orderly. It all comes from the image of Immanuel Kant. They say that the, uh, the housewives of Königsberg used to set their kitchen clocks by the time that he would pass by their windows on his daily constitutional. So um, Immanuel Kant, non-Jewish philosopher, um, 
came up with a book called The Critique of Pure Reason. He basically wrote nothing till he was in his 70s, and then he came out with a flurry of incredibly important, earth-shaking uh, philosophical works that had tremendous impact. Uh, the Critique of Pure Reason essentially argued that all prior philosophies could not be relied upon because all we have to measure our experience is ultimately empirical. Meaning, and this is, you know, we've gone past this into postmodernism, but the idea that, you know, we can think up all kinds of theories about the universe and all kinds of theories about physical world and, and the laws of the physical world, but ultimately we can only measure those ideas and those experiences through the physical sensations, the organs that we possess, our eyes, our ears, even our mind is limited by the actual matter that makes these things up. And as a result, we have no way with logic to penetrate any kind of higher mysteries. All we have are the tools to measure the world. It's kind of like saying, um, you know, I would like to um, create a... Um, a loving relationship with my children by using a, a Lego set. You know, it can't be done. Those are not the right tools for creating the effect that I want to. I may, you know, achieve some level of happiness by giving them the Lego set or maybe by playing with them, but I can't say, okay, I'm going to stick this red piece on my kid's shoulder and this blue piece on his head, and then he will love me. It's just not the right tools to actually affect that change. So therefore through Kantian's, Kant's critique of pure reason, there's a limit to philosophy. Uh, I, there is a reason why I'm explaining this to you. Um, because what Horowitz essentially said, based on Kant, is that none of the philosophers will ever touch eternity. None of them will ever have a chance to measure God. None of them will ever have a chance to define the soul. None of them will ever be able to explain to the world what is the meaning of existence. That is simply not within the purview of philosophy. And moreover, any philosopher who goes about saying that such and such is true will eventually be superseded. Just like Aristotelian physics were, you know, the rage for several centuries. Then along came Isaac Newton and blew it all away. And we were very happy with Isaac Newton. And along came some Jewish guy named Albert Einstein. And now Isaac Newton no longer is relevant. And this is, it's all a world of change. It's an olam hasheker that ultimately will be overturned. So therefore, what do we make of uh, not only our philosophy, but our scientific world. What Hurwitz said, and this is, I think, a very sophisticated um, philosophical point, is that we should enjoy the increasing level of discovery that the scientists can offer us as a an expanding way of experiencing the niflaos haboyre, the wonders of the creator. And every new discovery, we say, wow, that is amazing, Look how fascinating the creation is. Appreciate it, enjoy it, but never think that now we have discovered the ultimate truth. Because at some point, another philosopher, another scientist will come along and show us how that previous presumption was totally wrong. And so he takes Immanuel Kant and essentially places science within a theoretical perspective that allows us to appreciate it like the unfolding of flower with the dawn, without anticipating that that flower will remain forever. We know that that flower will one day wilt and die, and another flower will come up and take its place, perhaps a more wondrous, beautiful flower. And that's essentially how he says we should orient ourselves to science. Now, this happened to have extremely important implications for religious Jews, because if you think about the... Uh, the, co the potential conflict of science with religion, Jews in particular, you know, we do have certain, we're not nearly as rigid about certain things like, you know, a, a Ptolemaic universe as opposed to a Copernican as perhaps the medieval Catholic Church was. But nevertheless, we do have certain passages in the Talmud and certain passages in Rishonim that, you know, are problematic when it comes to the, um, 
the discoveries of modern science. And we continue to have these problems. And, um, you know, Hurwitz's approach is saying, okay, you know, it's interesting that it appears there is a contradiction between this one passage in a medieval religiously uh, proved poet and what science is telling us about the shape of the universe or the orbit of the planets. Uh, but we don't have to resolve that contradiction. We can say that religious texts are describing eternity on a very profound level, and science is describing our approach to the physical world in a very useful way, but not necessarily coming anywhere close to the religious implications of the sources that we rely upon. This allows us to uh, achieve kind of a Brechtian suspension of disbelief and allow us to proceed along scientific trajectories at the same time we are maintaining steadfast in religious belief. A fascinating, very important fine point in an intellectual posture that allowed Jews to find a safe intellectual space to maintain their Yiddishkeit and still proceed with modernity and not you know, simply ignore its potentials. I forgot what I was going to talk about next, so I have to quickly go forward. Oh, yes, right. So, uh, and ironically, what does give us the access to those greater truths? Kabbalah. It is so amazing to see that the Sefer Abrit is really written by an extremely enthusiastic Kabbalist, a follower of Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, the incredible Arizal of, uh, of Tzfat, and in particular, uh, his disciple, Rabbi Chaim Vital, who we spoke about here just a few weeks ago, uh, most notably his his seminal Kabbalistic, moralistic work, Share Kedusha, The Gates of Holiness, which describes a, uh, a step-by-step path to holiness. Uh, Rabbi Hurwitz felt that the Share Kedusha was really the, the route by which Jews could achieve a spiritual perfection, and there was no contradiction whatsoever between our appreciation of the world around us with the most advanced tools we have to understand that world and the Kabbalistic path of self-perfection that is outlined in the work of Rabbi Chaim Vital. Fascinating. One would think that they're the two opposites, you know, Kabbalah with its mysticism and its otherworldliness and what sounds like you know, from a scientific point of view, it sounds like gobbledygook when you try to read Kabbalistic works. They don't offer proofs using Greek logic or anything like that. And on the other hand, science with its rigid, show-me kind of attitude, it's it, the scientific hypothesis followed by experimentation and so on, they are two different vocabularies for two different systems of appreciating the world. The Share Kedusha is for appreciating eternity, and science is for appreciating the temporal world. You know, that's an excellent question. Um, The question, for those of you who might not have heard it, does it contradict Immanuel Kant's notion that one could not, you know, one cannot grasp the infinite in that regard? So I'm not a Kantian scholar uh, by any means. I did read a a great book of his, and the title of which was Religion in der Grenzen von Blüsten Vernunft. I just like the way that sounds but it means religion within the boundaries of reason alone. And if I remember correctly, when I read that book, um, it, it was all within trying to figure out what, were, what would a divine being, what a supreme being's uh, order be for the world, and using only logical skills to try and determine what our posture should be towards that divine being. So... Um, I I think based on my limited understanding of Immanuel Kant, I would say that, uh, yeah, he does contradict him, that he would say that through Kabbalah, through things like Share Kedusha, which describes a way to this concept of Kedusha, I don't think Kant would have such an idea of Kedusha in the same sense that that Rabbi Chaim Vital would have. Uh, It could be accessed, but it could not be accessed through logic. With logic, with reason, all we can get is commandment. Right? God wants us to behave in this way, we behave in this way, we march forward and so on. And, and Kant was very big into commandment, very big into the concept of duty and what ration demands one do. 
um, whereas um, I, the Kabbalah is not necessarily as locked into that possibility. Okay, that's a great question. That was a little too hard a question for me. I hope you don't mind. We'll, we'll go easy on... Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, there were Yiddish translations. There were Ladino translations. There were many other versions of it. It has not been translated into English, largely because... I mean, it takes a lot of energy to read 400 pages of 18th century science today. You know, you'd have to be a scholar of the history of technology to really want to read 400 pages about hot air balloons and smallpox vaccinations and stuff like that. Um, but in the 19th century, as Jews were still just, you know, this is before electricity, before the telegram, before all kinds of things, to see these things developing, they're very excited about it and willing to invest the effort. I mean, Ladino and Yiddish translations. Popularity in the Sephardic world, popularity in the Ashkenazic world the simultaneously. Okay. Yes, absolutely. It was a book he published. We don't know he was a Makubal, I mean, a, a, a someone who had, had mastered Kabbalistic wisdom. He was a fan of Shari Kedusha. I mean, I'm a fan of Shari Kedusha. That's a, it's a great book, and it's accessible. It's easy to read in Hebrew, and it offers... I mean, I don't understand all of it, but... You know, like I, I love one section of Shari Kedusha when it says, okay, steps to achieving holiness. Step one, perfect your character. Step two, right? And that, wow, well, my gosh, one step. That's like, how am I supposed to do that? That's like, it's like, you know, put on a blue hat. How am I? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm in a good mood. I'm, I'm getting off topic. Shall we go on? Yes, we shall. Okay. Uh, and this is a great picture from the Hubble telescope. And I remember when I put this picture in, I was going to talk about everything I talked about while you were looking at that last slide. So we can go right past that. Okay. Uh, now, that's the scientific aspect of it. And I think that would be in itself enough to make Sefer Abrit the kind of book that would create that intellectual pathway that allowed Jews to approach modernity. But it has another dimension entirely that's also quite fascinating worth discussing. Uh, this is something that... Um, uh, Professor Ruderman calls his moral cosmopolitanism. And this is highly unusual for 18th century works in particular. Uh, the um, Sefer Abrit, kind of like uh, David Gans's work, um, Tzemach David and others, um, argues for a rather expansive Jewish version of human siblinghood that is unusual, to say the least, in 18th century works. Um, specifically, if you think of the, the, the amazing verse in the Bible, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So if you look at, I would hazard, if you look at 95 out of 100 commentators on that passage, uh, through much of the corpus of rabbinic tradition, you will find that word reacha, which is often translated as your neighbor or your fellow, translated in a much more limited fashion. Reacha, using the word rea, means not just your fellow or your neighbor in proximity, but unzara, part of your tribe. Another Jew, another observant Jew. Like most of the, the trajectory of the commentators tends to limit the scope of what does it mean to love your fellow as yourself to the sense of saying it really is referring to loving your fellow observant Jew as yourself. Uh, and I think that would be a fair characterization of most rabbinic interpretations of that verse, certainly up until the 20th century. The, um, that's not to say that Judaism in any way, God forbid, condones a so-called double standard that allows uh, non-Jews to be treated with disrespect. We have other sources for that, like the uh, the concept of Tselem Elohim, the image of God that is impressed on every human being, uh, the concept of Kiddush Hashem, Marit Ayin, many other concepts that say that Jews obviously have to behave with a very high level of moral standards with everyone they interact with, Jews, non-Jews, without men, women, without any distinction. But this particular verse, via is usually interpreted to mean you should treat your fellow Jews with uh, a level of love. So uh, he takes a rather bold um, 
divergence from that trend of rabbinic commentary. And he says, no, this is referring to all humanity. He says that really the goal of humanity is to achieve a level of social harmony that can only be the result of this kind of um, philanthropic activity in the sense of uh, loving fellow men, that people should extend themselves, uh, and women of course, that people should extend themselves to you know, uh, love their neighbor, literally the people who live across the street even though they're from a different nationality, faith, gender, color, you name it. And he argues this quite forcefully. Uh, in fact, one of the sections of his, the second part of the book is called um, Ahavat Re'im, the, the love of friends. When there's that word again, Re'im, right, meaning like, like Re'acha. Um, and this particular section was frequently excerpted translated and published as standalone versions because it is a very, very strong statement of universal human siblinghood. Uh, he offers many stories to support his thesis, including one that was extremely influential in the late 18th century, the story of Maximilian Jewish Leopold von Braunschweig Lüneburg, who is shown here in the kind of Napoleon clothing. Uh, the story is this is a, a, a German nobleman who um, uh, was in the city of Oder when there was a huge flood and the, the Oder River had uh, washed away much of the, uh, the banks and people were drowning in the river. And he saw someone hanging on to a plank of wood in the middle of this raging river. And so the nobleman directed people to go out there and, and rescue him, that person who was drowning the plank of wood. Um, but the the uh, the town constables and so on were saying it's impossible, the water is, is moving too quickly, we'd all die. So he himself got into a boat. That's what this scene here is showing. He himself got into his boat. A boat. You can see that the, the, the townspeople are saying, I mean, the weather looks pretty nice in this picture, but I get the impression it must have been much more stormy. The, the people are begging him not to go. You see here even a common servant woman saying, please don't go, it's too dangerous. But he says, no, I will go out there and save this commoner. Right? This is a nobleman. It's a class issue here, a nobleman going out into the river. And he rows out there in this terrible tempest, and his boat capsizes, and he is killed. And it was a tragedy that, that reverberated throughout Germany and had an impact on, on none other, for example, Schiller, who was uh, wrote uh, his famous Ode to Joy with, with some inspiration of the story of uh, this uh, young duke, um, which also spoke about the value of, of human brotherhood and so on. Many rabbis, including the son of the uh, famous rabbi uh, Sofer, the Ksav Sofer's son, Moshe Sofer, wrote a, a sermon and published it in German, about this individual a eulogy, Jews and non-Jews were similarly moved by his selfless attempt to rescue a commoner and the tragic way in which he died. And so um, Rabbi Hurwitz, in his book, points to these kinds of examples of altruistic behavior as an ideal for all human beings and especially for his brethren. He excoriates the Ashkenazic community for their, um, you know, disdainful attitudes towards Sephardim. Um, it's interesting to note that Ladino translations of this particular section were very popular. Uh, and he, he talks about, you know, the class distinctions among Jews and, and about the uh, sort of reverse anti-Semitism or the discrimination against non-Jews that he felt was prevalent in his, his day and age. And he says that all of that has to go. It's fascinating to note how the um, the articulation of that, that intellectual space with regard to science also in Hurwitz's books can be expressed in terms of his demonstration of the way forward for Jews in a multicultural society. Let us not forget that he wrote this in Germany when Jews, well, he, he published it actually in the, what would later become the Czech Republic, but he wrote this in an era where Jews were not at all emancipated. Jews were clearly second class, uh, not even citizens. They were considered like uh, uh, travelers, vagrants. Um, in France in 1791, they would be 
uh, immediately uh, emancipated with tremendous difficulty, and they really didn't work that out until the early 19th century, which we'll talk about, by the way, in, in two weeks, God willing. Uh, but Jews were clearly uh, considered outsiders in those zemnich, and Jews themselves considered themselves not part of the general society. And he was arguing against that trend, saying that, no, we are part of general society. We must take our place proudly in that society, realize our obligations to our fellow citizens, although that term would not be used at that time, um, and take our responsibilities seriously. And this was also something that could be understood as having great implications for the modern era in Europe and, of course, in America. A very prescient understanding of uh, Jewish responsibilities in a multicultural society. Um, pausing for questions, arguments? Okay, so th those are the two really big takeaway elements of his work. Uh, now I'd like to just turn very briefly to a controversy that erupted shortly after he published the work and it began to take off. Um, he published the, his first edition anonymous, anonymously in 1797, um, and it met with tremendous uh, appeal and uh, sold very well right away. Uh, this is, by the way, the uh, German text of the censor's approbation. Um, the, it was also published in Hebrew as well. Um, in 1801... Rabbi Hurwitz was shocked to discover that someone had printed a pirated edition of his book, uh, missing the approbation and the censor's letters, and was selling it on the side. Now, we have to remember, this is still the Wild West of printing days, and uh, the, the, the expense of producing a book was significant. But if you could simply take someone else's book and give it to a typesetter and say, here, follow it page by page, letter by letter, that significantly reduces the labor hours involved in setting up the original typeset. And they could churn out a, a, a reproduced edition very quickly. And if it's popular, people will buy it. And you can make a lot of money like they do, I understand, in China, simply copying, you know, software and reselling it again, or videos, things like that, must be a big risk. So <laughs> what happens is he, he discovers this second edition is running around. Now, he's a little upset on a business level because he put a lot of money into his work, and, you know, he's losing all these sales, but he takes a very interesting approach to it. First, he writes an expanded second edition of his own book with a lot more material to make it clear that this expanded version is much more is much highly improved and second of all he says after i think it was 5 years i am releasing copyright entirely anybody who wants to reprint my book may do so with my blessings however he's stipulating 12 distinct rules I have here Professor Ruderman's book, and this is such an unusual kind of thing that he uh, translates the rules in it, which is, I think, quite fascinating. Um, the reason for the translation, uh, for the rules, are primarily to ensure the fidelity of his thought. He wants to make sure that if people are going to steal his work, they should steal it right. So here he goes. Um, Uh, thus, beginning in 1809 and subsequently, it is permitted for anyone to publish it. This is my desire in order to increase the Torah and to enhance wisdom so that intelligence will grow among my people. But this will only be satisfied by the publisher if he will fulfill the following conditions which I enumerate below. One, he will publish this later edition, not the first edition, since this is completely unlike the first Two, the paper will be good and attractive and strong. Three, the letters will be large or mid-sized, but not small. He was really upset that this other edition, it wasn't really nice to read. Four, one should not add or subtract anything from the book, etc. Now, here's one of my favorites, five. The end of the first part of the book should be published on the same page with the beginning of the second part. 
And he goes on with great detail. It's exactly the way he wants it laid out. Reasons for this? Why would he want the second part of the book to be published on the same page as the end of the first part? Mr. Professor Levine? So you can't separate them. That's right. You can't cheat people. And say you, you have to publish the whole thing because you'll see that there's a second part. And if you buy it without that second part, you say, hey, what's going on here, right? Um, he didn't like indexes. There shall be no index to my book. Why would he not like an index? That's right. He figured that, oh, people want to know hot air balloons. I'm going to just look up hot air balloons and I'm not going to... He says, no, no, no. I want people to read from the beginning to the end. That's why it's not really an encyclopedia in that regard. Uh, he has a whole section on that. Um, he talks about the size of the book, the kinds of abbreviations. He doesn't want... You know, Hebrew loves abbreviations. There are tons of abbreviations. What themselves are are acronyms, and, and they can be very confusing. Roshe Tevot is a term in Hebrew. And in fact, if you, for example, regularly read Lithuanian literature, and then you go and you read Hasidic literature, they'll use the same combinations of letters for completely different abbreviations. Um, uh, he doesn't like uh, cutting off the ends of final words. Sometimes Words will be abbreviated. Um, he wants to make sure that they, they only hire strong men to press the pages, right? Because the technology would be you'd have this big, heavy, uh, sort of like waffle iron, and you'd have the ink there and the paper underneath and the typeset, and you would have a, a strong man who would, like, push it down. Uh, and if you have a weakling or someone who's lazy, he's just going to touch it down, and the letters won't be strong, and they'll they'll have cracks in them, and they'll be faded. So he was really particular about the actual aesthetics of the work. And he goes on. I'm not going to go into great details. There are 12 such rules about his publications. And it's it's a fascinating entire story just in the history of printing. Okay, that's an interesting kind of footnote there. So... Looking at the legacy of uh, Sefer Abrit, we don't know a lot about Rabbi Pinchas Horowitz himself, his family, uh, his children, anything like that. In fact, we only know about 15 years of his life from uh, this is his peregrinations as he's selling this particular book. Uh, but as Rab Professor Ruhrman points out, I think, with, uh, with great conviction, this is actually an extremely important book for understanding how Jews were able to pivot towards modernity in a very constructive and stable manner. Um, although Judaism uh, as a faith would be faced with uh, incredible pressures with modernity, we will be exploring them over the next few weeks, um, and Jews did not always maintain their attachment to the traditional uh, behaviors and beliefs of their ancestors. Nevertheless, Rabbi Hurwitz's Sefer Abrit offers a theological direction and space for Jews to find a way to be able to uh, engage themselves fully in the modern world and yet retain uh, traditional religious values, even mystical Kabbalistic values. So with that, uh, I think I should conclude Thank you very much for your enthusiasm. And uh, at this point, if you applaud, it sounds good on the Internet. Thank you. Stand clear of the closing doors, please.